The story of Jacob takes a dramatic turn in chapter 28. Uh, take your Bible and go to the 28th chapter of Genesis. Notice what happens in that chapter. First of all, Isaac meets with him and reconfirms the blessing to him. Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and then commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Uh, once you go to Padan Aram, back to Haran, to Syria, take a wife from among our family, etc., uh, from the uh, daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful. Uh, but notice verse 4. May He give you and your descendants the blessing of Abraham. Underline that. So that you may take possession of of the land, underlying possession of the land, that the promise of the Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional covenant to give to Abraham's descendants the land of promise, hence the term, the promised land, that the land of Canaan would eventually become the land of the sons of Abraham. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant was committed then to Isaac, the son of the covenant, the son of the promise, and Isaac commits it now to Jacob. Uh, that God would not only bless you, but He would give to you and your descendants the land of promise. Now, throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites are always concerned about the issue of the land, uh, an issue that is still debated and discussed and struggled over even today in the Middle East. To whom does the land belong? The Bible makes it clear that the land belongs to God. It's His land. Uh, that God can let it out to any tenant He wants to, and God chooses because of the sin of the Amorites and the Canaanites when it has come to the full. Remember He told Abraham, 400 years they have. That's a long time. If they don't repent and turn to Me, I'll bring your descendants back into the land after 400 years, and they'll take the land from the Canaanites, and they will eventually rename it after Jacob, whose new name will eventually be Israel. Well, Jacob prepares to leave home. Uh, notice verse 10 of chapter 28. Jacob left Beersheba in the south uh, and set out for Haran, underline the name Haran, in Syria to the north. Uh, and when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head to lay down to sleep. And then he dreamed a, a dream. No wonder, sleeping on a rock. And he saw a, a stairway or a ladder that reached up to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it and above it there stood the Lord Himself. He sees this stairway into heaven. It represents access into the presence of God. He sees the angels of God coming and going on the staircase and then above it He sees the Lord. Uh, and He said to him, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Isaac. Notice again, all capital letters. I am Yahweh, I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. Notice he does not say, and your God. I'm not convinced prior to this experience that Jacob really personally knew God until this encounter with God. But then God went on to say, and I will give to you and your descendants the land of on which you are lying. Circle the word land in verse 13. Notice again the significance of the promise, the commitment of the land. What is Jacob doing? He's running away from the land. He's running away from home. He's leaving the promised land, going north beyond the borders of the promised land into Syria, and God is saying to him, I will bring you back one day to this land. I will give this land to you and your descendants. There could not have been a more appropriate time for God to affirm that commitment to Jacob. Well, Jacob wakes up. He's stunned. He's shocked. He said, uh, I will be with you, verse 15. Where I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land until you know that I have kept my promise. And when Jacob awoke out of his sleep, Verse 16, he said, Surely the Lord was in this place, and I was not aware of it. And he was afraid. And he said, How awesome or dreadful is this place. This, this is, is, is none other than the house of God, uh, and, and this is the gate of heaven. And early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head, and he set it up for a, a pillar, like an altar. And he poured oil 
on top of it. He, he didn't have a lamb for a sacrifice, so he did the next best thing. He builds an altar unto the Lord, a, a pillar unto God, and then he takes the most valuable thing that he has for his journey across the desert, oil, and pours it over the pillar. In, in essence, it was an act of submission to God that if you really are God, if you are who you say you are, I will submit my life to you. And he called the place Bethel, or Bethel, that used to be the city of Luz. Luz was the ancient Canaanite name of the town nearby. He's sleeping probably on the outskirts of town, just lying down on the ground, sleeping on a rock. Uh, has this encounter with God, and God tells him, I am Jehovah, I am the Lord, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. Am I going to be your God? And Jacob, stunned by this meeting with God, realizes that he is not only an infinite, but a personal God. And in the morning, he sets up the stone as the pillar. He pours out the oil. He makes the commitment. He surrenders his life to him. Now, remember the context again of the story. Go back to our outline again for a moment. Uh, Jacob deceiving his uh, brother and his father and the family. Why? He's still struggling over the issue, first of all, of the birthright. Who gets the position of leadership in the family? And then secondly, the, the blessing. Who gets the double portion of the father's goods? And even here at this obscure outpost of civilization, if you will, uh, at, at this little town north of Jerusalem, he stops and meets God face to face and renames the place Bethel, which in Hebrew means Beth, the house, El of God, the house of God. Now, there was no building there. There was no temple there, no structure there. It was just a place where he met God. But for him, it becomes the house of God. Uh, and if you watch Jacob's life, his spiritual experience tends to run parallel to this place. When he's right with God, he's at the house of God. When he's not right with God, he's not at the house of God. Uh, and without over-spiritualizing the story, I think there's a significance to all of this, that in that place where we have that encounter with God and meet with God in the house of God, and that becomes to us that place of worship in our hearts and lives, God wants us to continue that relationship with Him. Jacob has an encounter with God, makes a commitment to God, renames the place, which name the Jews will later give to this place. Uh, and yet in the morning, he's got to go on his way on the journey. Uh, chapter 29 says, He then continued on his journey, and he came to the land of the eastern peoples. And there he saw a well in the field uh, with three flocks of sheep lying nearby because the flocks were watered from the well, but the stone was over the mouth of the well. As the story unfolds in this section, Jacob uh, arrives in Haran, uh, and uh, he doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know how to find Laban, how to find his mother's family, etc. Uh, he goes to the well. That's the place of social interaction with one another. Uh, and, and arrives at the very same well Abraham's servant had arrived at years earlier. The very well where his mother, Rebekah, met the servant of Abraham. Jacob will meet uh, the woman who is destined to become his wife. Uh, but when he got there, notice the inside of the story. The stone was over the mouth of the well. The girls who come to water the sheep aren't strong enough to move the stone. And, and Jacob, now out from under the shadow of his domineering brother, finally has a chance to be his own man uh, and, and steps up and volunteers to say, hey, girls, don't worry. <clears throat> oh, I'll move the stone and rolls the stone away. Uh, well, Rachel hadn't watched him grow up, hadn't watched him be intimidated by Esau. Uh, she immediately attracted to him. Uh, she catches his eye immediately. Uh, she comes out to, to water the sheep. And it says in verse 9, While he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Jacob then rolled the stone away in verse 10. And uh, in verse uh, 11, then Jacob kissed Rachel uh, and began to weep. 
I don't know if he was disappointed or she bit him on the lip or what happened, but you have this emotional Middle Eastern reaction that occurs here. And it's love at first sight. He is immediately attracted to her and she to him. Uh, they run up and greet one another, and he realizes this is Laban's daughter, Rachel. Rachel. Uh, she is his cousin, literally, in this passage, his kissing cousin. And in those days, they still married their cousins within family lines. Uh, the genetic breakdown was not yet complete. Uh, and so she thinks, well, here's the guy that could potentially be uh, my husband. They all had heard this story of how years earlier, uh, Abraham's servant showed up with 10 camels loaded down with gold and silver and treasure and uh, exchanged it uh, to marry uh, Rebecca. And now Rebecca his son, Yahob, uh, has uh, uh, arrived. Well, she runs home to tell her father. Verse 13 says, as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He runs out and bows down. Oh, Jacob, Jacob, so good to see you. How's my sister and all her money? I mean, her family. Uh, so nice to have you here. Come in, come in. He's thinking we're going to clean up again. Where's the camels? Where's the dowry? Jacob, uh, after several days of eating and socializing, says, Well, I, 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 I actually, I kind of left home under adverse circumstances, and I forgot uh, my checkbook and credit cards. I, I, uh, there, I don't have any camels. I, I really uh, don't have a dowry. I just have the promise of my father that eventually I'll get the blessing. There's a slight problem with my brother, uh, but we don't need to discuss that right right now, etc. After time goes on, he decides, look, I want to stay, but I don't have any money. So I tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll make the arrangement to work for you if necessary to pay for the girl. Now look at verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters, underline two daughters. The name of the older one was Leah, underline her name. And the name of the younger was Rachel, the girl that he met at the well the girl that attracted his attention. Probably the more outgoing, the more aggressive, the more sanguine, whatever you want to call her. But Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful, and Jacob was in love with Rachel. He, he goes to Jacob, uh, and Laban figures out something's going on here with, with him and Rachel. And finally, Jacob says, well, I'll tell you, I, I really, I would like to marry your daughter, Rachel. Good. But I don't have any money. How long would I have to work to earn enough wages to pay for her? And the answer was seven years. I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, well, it's better that I give her to you than to someone else, so fine, stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days for the love that he had for her. What? a sucker. Ah, uh, this guy is so in love with the girl, his mother's at home thinking, I sent him away for a few days. Where is this boy of mine? And he's in love. And seven years seems like a few days. He can't wait for the day of the wedding to come. But then the, the great turning point comes in the story. Jacob the deceiver becomes Jacob the deceived. Uh, Laban deceives him in the issue over the brides. Uh, he wants to marry Rachel, but instead uh, he ends up married to Leah, the older sister. You say, how in the world did they ever pull that off? Well, notice what it says uh, as you move on in the story. Uh, he, he finishes the seven years. He's paid for the time, etc., uh, but uh, verse 23 says, when evening came, they, they waited for an evening wedding when it was dark. He took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob uh, instead. Uh, verse 25, when morning came, he realized there was Leah. Uh, you say, how would that have happened? Well, first of all, you've got to understand the Middle East. 
Uh, a woman is dressed in an outfit that looks a lot like a burqa. Uh, she's in a robe that looks like a tent with her face all covered up. Uh, you can barely see her in there. The bride would have had all kinds of jewelry hanging over her face, over her eyes, made of coins that would represent uh, part of the uh, dowry, etc. Uh, and you could literally hide the identity of the woman. They get married at night. They're uh, in bed in the dark. He wakes wakes up in the morning and blah, it's the sister. What in the world have you done to me? And Laban, the ultimate deceiver, the chip off the old block says, well, I'm sorry, but you know, there is a custom in our country. We cannot marry the, the younger daughter before we marry the older daughter. So this is what you're going to have to accept. Well, Jacob doesn't want to accept it. Now, here he makes from a human standpoint a mistake. He, he does not stop. He does not pray. He does not ask God, God, what do you want? What is your will? He, he instead just insists, I want Rachel. If I have to, I'll marry them both. I'll, I'll, I'll pay for both of them if I have to. So Laban thinks, good. I get seven more years of work out of you. This guy ends up working twice for the same woman. Uh, he, he tells him, well, you're going to have to, in Leah's case, fulfill her week, he says. The one week of the honeymoon, the bridal week, as it's translated in some translations in verse 27. Uh, after a week, then you can be married to the other one as well. And he marries the two sisters to Jacob. Now, in these multiple marriages in the Old Testament, you never see God stepping in saying, this is what I want. This is my will. This is my direction. I think it's obvious throughout the Bible that God's ultimate ideal is one man for one woman for one lifetime. Uh, but when the patriarchs run ahead of God, when Abraham decides maybe we should have the child by the servant girl, uh, the surrogate mother, uh, what harm could it do? Plenty. Uh, what problem? It could create all kinds of problems for all kinds of people. And yet God in His grace also takes us where we are with our mistakes. God intervenes. He spares Ishmael's life. He blesses the Arab people. He gives them the opportunity of salvation just like He does to any other group of people because the decision that Abraham and Sarah made was not the fault of Hagar, the servant girl, or nor was it the fault of Ishmael, the child that was conceived. Uh, and, and so the grace of God is available to both. Uh, in this situation, God intervenes, uh, and, and in spite of Jacob's decision and choice, he's going to bless this family. Uh, the children that they will have will become the forefathers of the twelve tribes of Israel. But, but I want you to notice a couple of things. As we read on in the story, something becomes very evident eventually, and that is even though Jacob in his emotions thought he loved Rachel more, Jacob in his death was buried with Leah, not with Rachel. Rachel died while they were traveling on the road, giving birth to her second son, Benjamin, and she was buried outside the city of Bethlehem the very town where Leah's descendant, David, and Jesus would be born. For you see, when you look at the genealogy of Christ, Jesus descended through the line of Leah, not Rachel. Leah is the mother of Judah. It's the tribe of Judah that uh, fathers David, in essence, the king of Israel from the tribe of Judah, from the line of Christ, Jesus a descendant of David, a descendant of Judah, a descendant of, of Leah. God knew what He was doing. Even when the deceiver was deceived, even when it looked like everything was going wrong, God was going right. God knew exactly why He was going to do this. And even when Jacob pushed the issue and said, I'll marry the other one anyhow, God still intervenes. God still deals with the situation as it is. But God who knows the end from the beginning knows all along it's Leah's descendant that is the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. He's coming through the line of Leah, even if Jacob has to be deceived into marrying her. Well, he married both. Uh, they then 
uh, entered into a childbearing contest trying to win his favor. He worked for seven years to pay for Leah, seven more years to pay for Rachel. In essence, he was paying for Rachel twice. And then after 14 years, he worked six more years uh, for wages. So altogether, if you look at the chart again and you look at your notes again, notice he's spending 20 years of time uh, paying uh, to live in Laban's home, uh, to live with Laban's family. And after 14 years of labor to pay for the two women and six years of wages to pay for the cattle that he would receive as wages, God intervenes and blesses him anyhow in spite of himself. And at the end of this time, Jacob has become a wealthy man. God intervenes time and time again and the cattle that are decided upon that are born uh, end up genetically working out in his favor and they be, they, his herd gets larger and larger and larger. He has the ability to manage. He has the ability of hard work and labor. He comes into his own as a person. But finally the day came that there was just too much. Too many kids, too many cattle, uh, not enough room. Everybody was bumping into one another. And finally, the decision is made. It's time to leave. we got to get out of here. And we've got to go home. After 20 years, Jacob finally makes the decision. It's time to return to Canaan, to the promised land. It's time to go home, thinking that his mother would be there waiting for him and that his father must have died by now. But what he will discover is his mother has died and his father, surprisingly, is still alive. Now, in the meantime, during those 20 years, the two women enter into this childbearing contest that involves the two of them and their handmaids. Uh, immediately after the marriage, uh, the Bible says in verse 31, the Lord saw that Leah was not loved and he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Leah became pregnant. She named the firstborn Reuben. Uh, she becomes pregnant again in verse 33 uh, and has Simeon uh, and then Levi or Levi. And, and then in verse 35, Judah. Well, Rachel becomes jealous. Uh, she says to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. What's the matter here? Uh, and Jacob said, look, am I in the place of God? I, I'm doing everything I can. I can't make you have a baby, whatever. So then Rachel says, well, take Bela, my handmaid, have a child by her. Again, it's Middle Eastern custom. It was morally acceptable in their culture, but it wasn't the ideal will of God at all. And then Leah comes back and says, well, I can play this same game too. I've got Zilpah, my handmaid, uh, and you could have children by her. And he ends up fathering the 12 sons by four different women. Uh, and some of them are credited, so to speak, to Leah. Some of them are credited to Rachel. But as time goes on, the children become the 12 sons of Jacob who in turn become the forefathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Notice, first of all, the first four, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And eventually, the birthright will be given to Judah. He will be given the position of leadership in the family. In the 49th chapter of Genesis, the scepter of leadership passes to the tribe of Judah, not the eldest son. In fact, not the eldest three. It goes to son number four. Then the other sons in the family, Bela becomes the mother of Dan and Naphtali, who become the tribes of Dan and Naphtali. Zilpah, the mother of Gad and Asher. Then Leah gets pregnant again with Issachar and with Zebulon. And then finally, Rachel gets pregnant with Joseph. Uh, and Joseph is the one that is going to receive the blessing the double portion. Uh, because as we get into Old Testament history, we will discover there is no tribe of Joseph per se. There are two tribes. Uh, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, each become a tribe. So in reality, there are really 13 tribes. The Levites become the priests and they do not get a portion of the land. The other 12 tribes, counting the double tribe of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, they get the land. The Levites get the priesthood. 
Uh, ultimately, the tribe of Dan is not able to hold on to their territory, and they become a, an apostate tribe, uh, and they turn away from God. They're not listed in the book of Revelation as part of the future kingdom of God in the future. And if we parallel the 12 tribes of Israel to the 12 apostles in the New Testament, there are some uh, interesting parallels. There are 12 tribes, but really there's 13 because of the two Joseph tribes. There are 12 apostles, uh, but one of them uh, abdicates, so to speak. Uh, Judas, who betrayed Christ, uh, is replaced by Matthias, uh, just as the tribe of Dan is eliminated and replaced. Uh, God always does things decently and in order. He knows exactly what He's doing. Uh, and the pictures of the Old Testament, as well as the prophecies, the types and the illustrations help us understand better what's happening in the New Testament. Look at the list again. You've got 12 sons of Jacob, and uh, one of them, Judah, gets the birthright. One of them, Joseph, receives the blessing. But all of them have the opportunity to be part of the nation of Israel and become the forefathers of Israel the tribes of Israel. Well, the decision is made. Time to get out of here. Time to go home. Take the kids. Pack up the family. Uh, let's leave. Uh, and they wait until Laban is out of town. They're afraid to confront him. And while he's gone, they pull up the tent stakes, roll up the tents, pack up the camels, load up the sheep and the cattle, and they leave Syria headed south uh, on their journey back to the promised land. Laban hears that they've left. He jumps on a horse, chases after them, catches up with them, screams at them in the middle of the desert, where are you going with my children and my stuff? And Jacob says, that they're my children and it's my stuff and we're out of here. They have an argument right there in the middle of the territory between Syria and Canaan and finally uh, they, they draw a, a line right there in the desert floor. You stay on your side and I'll stay on my side and, and the Lord watch between you and me uh, that you never cross this line uh, again. Uh, and they set the marker down, uh, and they make the decision, uh, and, and finally uh, Laban, out of anger and frustration, turns around uh, and goes home, uh, and, and the pillar, the marker that has been set up, that is to stand there as a witness between them, is to be a witness uh, that they will not cross the line. They, they call the marker in verse 49, Mizpah, the Lord watch between you and me when we're absent from each other. This is the boundary marker. This is the boundary line. God stand here and watch the boundary line, that you don't cross it, that I don't cross it. You don't bother me, I won't bother you. Now, the way the verse reads out of context, people uh, read that in Mizpah. The Lord watch between you and me when we're absent one from another. I've seen it on Christian greeting cards. Uh, it really means God strike you dead if you ever cross this line. So if you ever get that greeting card, ask yourself, why did they send that to me? Uh, anyhow, they, they settle the argument. Laban goes home to Syria. He steps out of the biblical story at this point. Jacob is headed south on his way, presumably, back to Bethel, back to meet with God. Why? Because God has already appeared to him and told him, it's time to come back to Bethel. I am the God of the house of God. Jacob, when are you coming home? All right, all right, we're coming. Uh, but on the way, he runs into struggles and problems and difficulties. Uh, he gets to one point where it says the angels of God met him. They're trying to encourage him. Jacob, you can do it. Don't panic. Don't turn back. But then when you get to chapter 32, verse 6 says, when the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, uh, we, we went to your brother Esau, who is coming to meet you. Uh, Jacob, Esau, Esau heard that you're coming back to uh, the promised land, and he's coming up to, to meet you. Hasn't seen you in 20 years. Great. And he has 400 men with him. Not so great. Uh, verse 7 says of chapter 32, In fear and distress, Jacob divided the people into two groups. 
a real hero this guy is. He, he, he sends the handmaids and their children on first, then Leah and her kids, then Rachel and Joseph, who the, was the only one that had been born at this point, uh, and Jacob went last. He sent everybody across the Jabbok River uh, and said, you, you, you go on ahead, I'll, I'll be there soon. And he's pacing around that night wondering, what am I going to do? Esau is going to kill me. He hasn't forgiven me after all these years. How am I going to face him? I can't go back to Laban. I've got to go on. What will I do? And it's that night that the angel of the Lord appears to him. But in panic, I think Jacob thinks, bah, it must be Esau. Somebody speaks to him in the middle of the night. Yaakov bah, grabs him. And he wrestles with him and fights with him all night long. Uh, so when Jacob was left alone in verse 24, a man wrestled him until daybreak. Uh, he struggles with him. Uh, and when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and the hip was wrenched out of joint. Uh, and finally the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. And Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you... Bless me. What's he wrestling over? The guilty conscience with the blessing. Thinking I stole the blessing from Esau. Now I have to go and face Esau. How am I going to resolve this? And the man said, what's your name? And he said, uh, it's Jacob, Jacob. Deceiver, manipulator, conniver, crook, supplanter. And the man said to him, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. In verse 28, circle the name Israel. It's the first time it appears in the Old Testament. The first time in the Bible, it means a prince with God. And then he blessed him there. He wrestles with an angel or perhaps the Lord himself in some way that God accommodates himself to the struggle. It's not that God cannot overpower him. Certainly he can. Uh, that God is not trying to beat him up. God is trying to break him inside. God is trying to break his pride, break his resistance, break his rebellion, break that stubbornness. Jacob, you manipulator, you deceiver you. Don't you understand? God wants to make you a prince. You can be Israel, a prince with God. He leaves this encounter with God, stunned, uh, realizing, perhaps for the first time, a, a greater destiny than he has ever sensed before, and yet limping, uh, because in that counter uh, it is the effect uh, of the struggle he limps on the next day to the meeting with Esau. And then in chapter 33, Esau shows up. Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. Oh no. Uh, and he ran right past the handmaids and Leah and Rachel and ran right up to Jacob and grabbed him. What happened? Look at verse 4 of chapter 33. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept. Instead of killing him, there is this wonderful emotional uh, reunion between them. Uh, he's telling them, oh, Jake, it's just so good to see you. You haven't been here for 20 years. Well, you look good. Whose kids are all these kids? Uh, they're, they're, they're my, really, you're pretty good. Uh, whose stuff is all this stuff? It's, 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 it's mine. Well, you know, this is never going to fit in Dad's garage. Uh, you, you, you know, you're going to move back in with Dad. You know, there's not room for all of this. You, you, I, I moved out myself a long time ago. Married me a couple of Hittite women. And, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, I also married one of Ishmael's um, daughters. Uh, and I moved on down into Edom, down in the south. Got me my own kingdom down there in the Red Rocks. Fits with Big Red, you know. Uh, and uh, you, you could just move in with us. Uh, why don't you just come on and move in with us? We got plenty of room for you down there. Jacob's thinking, I'm not going anywhere near you, buddy. Uh, I get down there into Edom and you'll kill me. That's what you'll do. I, it's good to see you, Esau. I tell you what, you, you go on ahead and tell your wives that, you know, we'll be there in a few days. He doesn't know what a few days means. 
the, the, the kids are kind of young. The cattle's kind of tender. We'll just move on slowly here. Now, if we, could, if we could look at all of these events on a Bible map, he was about 10 miles from Bethel when he encountered Esau. And instead of moving further south, he panics. He turns back north and settles uh, outside uh, the city of Shechem. Look at the end of chapter 33. Uh, Jacob, when he had safely arrived, came to the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped in sight of the city. Uh, and for 400 pieces of silver, that's a lot of money. He's wealthy. He bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, uh, the boy for whom was named after the town, a plot of ground. And there he pitched his tent uh, and there he set up an altar, and he called it El Elohe Israel, God, the God of Israel, uh, that he is identifying his worship of Jehovah as the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of the children of Israel, the God that will ultimately lead them back to this land of, of promise. The problem was that everything went wrong in Shechem. Again, he didn't pray. And ask God what to do. Didn't say, is this the right choice? He pitches his tent and parks his family outside one of the most ungodly cities in all of Canaan. The city that archaeologists have excavated the remains of and discovered that virtually every body in the cemetery has evidence of venereal disease. Uh, a city that was overrun with hundreds and hundreds of idols, idols that would eventually make their way into the pockets of his own children. It, it is there in chapter 34 that his only daughter, Dinah, is raped and kidnapped. Uh, he, he's struggling with what to do. Uh, Hamor, the king of the city, is embarrassed and says, look, I'm sorry my son kidnapped your daughter, uh, but I, we, could, we could have a marriage. We could do something here. Uh, Jacob is, is about to agree to this, which would have then corrupted the whole line of the Messiah at that point when finally two of her brothers, Levi and Simeon, decide, we're going to let our sister be treated this way. They sneak into the city under false pretenses, uh, end up killing all the men in the city and kidnapping back their sister. Jacob is horrified. Instead of thanking, he says, what have you done to me? The Canaanites will hate me. They'll all gang up on me. They'll kill us all. Oh, oh God, behold, all things are against me. No, really, everything was ultimately going to work out for him. At every detour, at every sidetrack, every time he makes the wrong decision, there are consequences to the decisions. But those consequences do not eliminate the power and the sovereignty of God who overrules even the worst of circumstances to ultimately produce the best of results. They had to leave. They had to flee. They had to get out of there. They have to run for their lives. And finally, God intervenes in chapter 35 and tells him what to do. Look at 35.1. God said to Jacob, go up to what place? Bethel. Circle it in 35.1. Settle there. Build there an altar to God who appeared to you in the day that you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Jacob, didn't you get it? You ran away once before and you came to Bethel and I met you at Bethel at the house of God. I spoke to you in Haran. I told you to come back here and you didn't do it. Just stopped someplace else. You've got this mess on your hands. Get out of there. Come back to Bethel and build an altar there to God. This becomes the turning point now in Jacob's life spiritually. Oh, there are turning points when he's deceived into marrying Leah and that becomes the line of the Messiah. Uh, there are turning points when he has to run away from Esau, a turning point when he has to confront uh, Laban, but the ultimate spiritual turning point comes at Bethel. All of a sudden, Jacob, after all these years of lying and deceiving and manipulating and trying to make it all work out the right way, finally submits himself to God and says, all right, you win. We'll go back to Bethel. He has a change of heart. And in that change of heart, he deals with his kids. Look at verse 2. Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, get rid of the strange gods that you have with you uh, and purify yourselves and change your clothes. 
somehow the very way they looked and dressed was typical of unsaved people of that day. Uh, the idols of the Canaanites had made their way into the hands of his own children. Uh, this is a family that is spiritually divided, that is emotionally divided, that is psychologically divided from each other, uh, in which there is favoritism and manipulation going on, everybody trying to figure out their place in the family. And all of a sudden, Jacob gets right with God and finally stands up and says, All right, enough of all of this. Straighten out right now. We're going to go to Bethel. Come, let us go to Bethel, and I will build there an altar unto God. Verse 4 says, So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and all the rings that were in their ears, uh, apparently somehow cultically designed to represent the worship of, of other gods. Uh, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem, and as they set out, the terror of God fell on the cities round about them. Why? Because God was pleased with that commitment. Jacob finally decides to clean house, to get right with God, get all this trash and all this junk out of here, straighten this place up. We're going back to the house of God. Now, let me throw in a word of caution here. He got right with God. It changes his life from this point on. Little Joseph, who grows up under this father who has experienced this revival moment with God, is going to be greatly blessed by all of this. But the problem is, the other kids were already teenagers. They were already well grown. Uh, they had been watching him lie and steal and manipulate and connive for years. And when an adult has a spiritual experience with God or a conversion late in life and he has grown children, they will almost always put it to the test. Kids are going to stand back and say, man, the old man got religious. I don't know what happens. He claims he met with God, but I think he's the same old crook he always was. And they're going to push you and push you and test you and test you and see if they can upset you. And you'd better be the new person that you really say you are at that moment because they're going to check it out to see if it's for real, and that's exactly what happened. He stopped sowing his oats, so to speak, <laughs> but the crop kept coming in for a while. Now, once you stop sowing, the, you know, the less is going to be harvested later, but some of it was still going to be reaped. Uh, his kids were still going to be filled with jealousy and deception themselves. The boys would eventually turn on Joseph and turn against Joseph and deceive their father, the deceiver into thinking that Joseph was dead. But at this point, he makes it clear, we're getting right. We're straightening out. We're going to Bethel. They got right with God, changed their clothes, gave him all the junk. He buried the trash. They set out on a journey back to the house of God. And then Jacob, verse 6, and all the people that were with him came to Luz. That was the Canaanite name of the town. That is Bethel in the land of Canaan. And there he built an altar and he called the place El Bethel, circle that in verse 6. Uh, the house of God is Bethel. El Bethel is the God of the house of God. He was making it clear, I'm, we're not just coming back to church. We're not just coming back to the house of God. We're coming back to God. He is going to be God in our lives. He is going to be the Lord and the master of our lives. And as he finally returns, more than 20 years later, we have no idea how long he was in Shechem. He finally comes back to Bethel. It finally becomes the spiritual turning point in his life. And Jacob walks away a new man, a broken man, a man who's wrestled with God a man who has finally submitted and surrendered and begged God to reaffirm the blessing that he had stolen by deception, a man who stops being Jacob and becomes Yisrael, the prince with God. Ultimately, as they continue the journey, they make their way eventually southward toward Bethlehem, the very town where later Leah's descendants, David and Jesus, will be born. It is there that Rachel gives birth to her last child. Uh, verse 16 says, And they moved from Bethel, and while they were still some distance from Ephrath, another name for Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid, you will have another son. But as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named the son Ben-Oni, son of my sorrow. But his father named him Ben-Yamin, son of my right arm. Uh, the tragedy in the story is that Rachel, his favorite, dies delivering Benjamin, the twelfth son of Jacob. Uh, outside the very town of Bethlehem, Rachel's tomb still stands there till this day uh, as a memorial to the place where she died, in sight of the place where Leah's descendants would become the kings of Israel. There, Rachel, uh, delivering the baby, says, Name the baby ben Oni." son of my sorrow. And Jacob comes back and says, no, no, no. We'll name him Benjamin, son of my right arm. You can see the whole family as they're straining and struggling and begging this girl to breathe, begging her to stay alive. The baby is born. The mother dies. The child has to then be raised by Leah and the handmaids. Uh, has to be cared for by the family. And the child immediately becomes another of his favorites. Notice the 19th verse. Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, and then the footnote, that is Bethlehem. Underline Bethlehem in verse 19. First place the name appears in the Old Testament. The town where later, centuries later, Joseph and Mary will make their famous journey at Christmas time. And there, Jesus will be born in fulfillment of prophecy. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a, a pillar. And to this day, the pillar marks Rachel's tomb. To what day? The day of the author. The day of the uh, people of Israel as they are first coming into the land. Then you have the list of the twelve sons. You have the statement of the death of Isaac at age 180. He lived for years after he thought he was going to die. Then you have a long list of Esau's descendants, uh, and then the story begins to shift to Joseph. Go to chapter 37. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, in the land of Canaan. Underline, land of Canaan. Now, this is the account of Jacob. You, you always have these sort of summary statements at the end of a section as though we, we have finished one section and then it introduces us to move on to the next section. This time, the story shifts to Joseph. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bela and the sons of Zilpah. Uh, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Uh, Joseph is the honest kid in the family. Joseph is the kid who keeps wanting to tell everybody the truth. Uh, Joseph is the one who keeps saying we've got to do the right thing. Uh, Joseph is the one uh, who keeps urging the family to do the right thing, and yet the tragedy is that Joseph is the one that they eventually turned against. Uh, when we Go back and review what had gone wrong in Jacob's life uh, and how God had turned it all around. We see the deliverance of Jacob and it prepares us then for the entrance of Joseph into the dominant part of the story. Uh, in his reunion with Esau, he finally has some sense of reconciliation with his brother. But then in the retreat from Bethel, he settles at Sukkoth on the edge of Shechem, and there Dinah is defiled and ultimately delivered. And God has to intervene dramatically again and again and again in their lives to bring them to a point where eventually, in the return to Bethel, everything was made right, finally, with God. We're going back to Bethel, back to the house of God. Put away the strange gods. Change your garments. Rebuild the altar. We're going back to the God of the house of God. Yes, there would be consequences in the years to come. 
difficulties, challenges and problems and struggles, but this great turning point marked a difference for this family because Joseph grows up under a godly dad, a dad whose heart and life have been changed. He sees in his father the right example. He tries to do the right thing, but the other brothers not only put their father to the test, but become jealous of Joseph and turn against Joseph. And all of a sudden, the tragedy of divided loyalties and divided love and a divided family take their toll again. Uh, Jacob does everything he can to uh, substantiate Joseph, to give him the, the robe of many colors, to show him that he's the son that is loved, uh, the son of the wife that has died, etc., uh, that somehow he wants to bless Joseph and, and little Benjamin. And yet as the other brothers out of jealousy turn against them, uh, the stage is going to be set for one of the great tragedies of Jacob's life, that one more time the deceiver will be deceived. Will this story ever settle out? Will good ever come out of all of these problems and all these difficulties? Where is God in all of this? Well, we're out of time. As the music plays and the Middle East turns, we'll be back in the next lesson to see what happened to Joseph and ultimately what happened to the 12 tribes of Israel.